All right. It is Monday of week three. Jenny, T minus what? 21 days. 21, three weeks today. Oh, my. Oh, my. The time draws short. Uh, <laughs> lots to talk about. Lots to talk about as we come back from the weekend. First of all, everybody good? Everybody survive it? Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. I'm a weekend warrior. Was <laughs> fucking down to Jenny's 40 Strider. pounder and ate a ball of hash. I fucking had a good time, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny's wearing her just Barry Cut Kenyemi Memorial jersey. Um, oh, don't get me Nick, Canes. let's get to it. We got to be tight today because we got a lot of stuff to get to. What's in the news? What's on the political playbook? So, David, you always talk about like you have the numbers. As soon as I leave, then you talk about the things you really want to talk about, right? Like Scott goes crazy, <laughs> Jenny goes crazy. So I crunched my own numbers this weekend. Um, Uh-oh. It, two oh, weeks yeah. have passed, and uh, and I wanted to know where the leaders have gone and what kinds of places they'd gone to. Uh, and compare it to 2019, because I am the kind of person who has spreadsheets for every election where I fill in 20 columns worth of data, and I just stare at it for hours at a time. So what I found was, you might remember in 2019, Andrew Scheer at this point in the campaign, two weeks in, had not gone to a conservative riding. He had not spent a single moment at an event in a conservative riding. And Jagmeet Singh, who was kind of floundering in the polls at that point, was still pretty much spending three, quarter of his, uh, three quarters of his time on offense. And Justin Trudeau uh, was a sort of split right down the middle on defending liberal turf, going elsewhere. So this time... Uh, we have Aaron O'Toole. We all know he's spent sort of days at a time in Ottawa, but when he leaves Ottawa, he's largely on offense. 83% of the time, I think is my calculation. Uh, and Justin Trudeau, 64% of the time when he's on the road, including today, that actually isn't part of these numbers. So it'll be slightly higher, uh, is in writings, not held by liberals. He's going to block writings. He's going to NDP writings. He's going to some conservative writings. And Jagmeet Singh this time is the one he's the sheer. He has spent zero moments in an NDP riding, except went to Hamilton, technically was in, in, in a riding held by his party, but it was really just a play for another one in town. So they were all on offense this time. And um, I guess you guys could probably talk for a long, long time about whether that's real or uh, whether all, they're all just faking each other out. But those are the numbers. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what the next few weeks are like now that I finally have this damn spreadsheet I can spend time on. Chicks dig spreadsheets, Nick. You're going to get a lot of action, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I picked the right wife, let me tell you. she's she's. I, I was at my computer all weekend. She was like, wow, Woo. the old you is back. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of offense, where's everybody today and, and what's, what's up today? Yeah, Aaron O'Toole is on offense. Uh, he's in King City, Ontario, north of, uh, north of the, the city of Toronto. And then he's heading over to Markham, Markham Thornhill. Uh, again, north of the city, those are two ridings held by not just liberals, but liberal cabinet ministers, Deb Shore. Markham, Thorn Markham Thornhill is Bob Soraya, is it not? That's a conservative. Markham Unionville is Bob Soraya, is it not? Oh, I could be wrong. You could be wrong. Is it I'm Markham sure. Unionville? Way, he's in Markham. Mary, there's, isn't there's a cabinet minister nearby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, Trudeau uh, is in, he's in Granby today, Quebec, uh, which is Shefford's block riding. And then he's flying north, the first to go to Academy. So he'll be in, he'll be in Nunavut before long. And uh, Jagmeet Singh starts in Ottawa. He's having a, an announcement on the ultra rich uh, paying their fair share at Tavern on the Hill. Maybe the place to get a drink in Ottawa with the best view of Ottawa. Uh, and then he's going to BC on, of course, offense. He's going to go to Ladysmith, where Paul Manley is the Green MP, and the NDP very much would like to have really all of Vancouver Island turn orange, so that's the goal for him today. And you were right about Soraya. Oh. Thank God, because that would have been an error in my newsletter and I wouldn't have slept. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all spending a lot of time in the air, right? Eh? Has anybody been on a bus up and down the 401 yet? Uh, Trudeau on day, maybe it was two, was on the 401 because uh, he hit up Napanee and Coburg. Uh, and Jigmeet Singh was on a different part of the 401. He went from Hamilton to Windsor. But um, relatively, I think, little time on that monstrous dis soul-destroying highway. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay, cool. Well, listen, thanks, Nick. Thanks for being here. I look forward to another week with you. Are you on the road this week or not? 
I don't think so. I don't think so. But um, after the debates, check back. Ooh, and okay. it gets real. I hope to God I get to go somewhere. It would be fun. It's it's not it's, very political. You get this man an expense kinds. account. You guys come on. Get this man an expense of, account of, of 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 fun movement and numbers. I know, and and I want to go find out where those numbers are. <laughs> <moving>. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Speaking of that, here are the numbers, folks. Jesus. All right. <laughs> so, little extra heavy duty because there was some Twitter action about this last night that uh, needs to probably be contextualized. So we've been reporting four-day roll-ups. So here is the four-day roll-up. Uh, conservatives, 37. Liberals, 29. NDP, 19. Greens, 3. People's Party, 5. Bloc Québécois, 6. Ontario on the four-day roll-up is 37 liberal, 36 conservative. Now, what had Frank Tweez the three-day roll-up last night on Twitter, Frank Graves did, and so the three-day roll-up, which of course has fewer cases, is less reliable, has 300 cases in Ontario. That's a margin of error of five percentage points. And they are showing 40% uh, liberal over the last three days, 33% conservative in Ontario, 19 NDP. And so that does look like uh, when one day was dropped, the fourth day was dropped and a new day was added, you had a slightly different race in Ontario than you've seen before. I will say that I also looked at ECOS' seven-day roll-up, which is all the cases they collected over the course of the last seven days, and it provides you with obviously much better regional samples. And it looked like, to me, overall, that Atlantic is closer than people would have expected between the Liberals and the Conservatives. It looked to me like the Conservatives are heading to ridiculous numbers in Western Canada including British Columbia, which is no longer looks like a three-way fight, looks like a conservative uh, domination in British Columbia. Ontario is a dog fight over seven days. We'll see if these new numbers pretend something different. And in Quebec, we're seeing, frankly, a lot of not liberal, not bloc vote. The conservative vote isn't bad. The NDP vote exists. Um, People's Party is significant in the province of Quebec. So... Uh, it's an interesting makeup out there. Um, either of you have any reaction to these poll numbers before we move on? I'm curious to see what tomorrow's are. There's so much change and such a dog's breakfast out there that um, uh, I have really no com like I have I have I have no comment. One of the things I would say is uh, in terms of the numbers, and David, I'm not sure if you found that, but when we did polling on weekends um, for any campaign I worked on, you guys always had a spike on the weekends. Like there was always. Uh, whether we were winning or whether we were losing, you guys, if we were doing any kind of polling over the course of the weekend, the Monday morning results, you guys were always, uh, you guys always took a spike. So um, uh, I guess we'll see. We'll see what, what he says tomorrow. Uh, um, I don't remember that pattern particularly, but I know that weekends are weird and you get some weird results, especially in tracking on the weekends. I mean, I, I guess I'll... I'll uh... I'll jump on the numbers, uh, even with all the caveats and asterisks that you guys are placing on them. And, and I'll say that I, I, I hope that the phenomenon Frank is highlighting in Ontario is occurring. I obviously hope it because, you know, I know there's lots of people out there watching me and David and going, gosh, I guess you guys don't even want the Liberals to win. Yes, I actually do want the Liberals <laughs> to win. Okay, fuck off. I want the Liberals to win. Um, and I've been... Wondering slash hoping and curious about this, obviously this, you know, the issue du jour, the, the protests and the ugliness of the protests, the visuals, the drama of, you know, that contrast between the prime minister, you know, speaking in a park or, you know, these guys yelling and screaming and all these terrible images and so forth. Um, oh, this is a sort of big kind of, you know, drive-in movie of intolerance you get out of those images. I've been wondering 
this question I've been wondering to myself, does just that image do anything in and of itself, just organically, just the image and the contrast, does it help uh, the liberal campaign? Does it help Trudeau? It positions him more sympathetically. It puts him in the position of leader. It actually gets him obviously talking more about some of the fundamental choices that are required in this campaign. Does that help him? Or does he need to do something? Do the liberals need to do something in order to take that conflict and turn it into uh, a working issue for them in the campaign, which I think is very dangerous. You got to be very careful about trying to weaponize something like that. People are so... Uh, so careful to scrutinize that you can't look like you're being exploitative. Um, nothing is more unsympathetic than trying to harness the appearance of sympathy for your own benefit, right? So, you know, so I've been wondering that. And I, again, I mean, obviously these numbers are caveated, but it suggests to me that one, these images in this conflict is breaking through to people, at least in, in, in Ontario. And two, that people are making associations with it and it's, and it's, and it's affecting their perspective on the parties. And um, I hope that's the case because I think that that's um, uh, I think that the liberal campaign needs that. And, um, you know, it's a little like 1968. Obviously, this comparison has been made all weekend when, you know, Pierre Trudeau sat in the box and refused to blink when people were throwing bottles and swear words at him at the Central Baptiste rally and everybody else fled. And um, and it's harder to pull off that kind of moment in a day like today because all three networks don't go to it. But hopefully, um, hopefully we'll. We'll see that. So that's what. Well, that, I, that's my I, hope. I, I'm not. I'm not. I know that's your hope. I'm not there. That I think the protests are are uh, uh, making any uh, uh, any effect, and it's it's they're making it sound like they're the only uh, uh, political like this protesting in Canada is such this novel and unique uh, thing. These crowds are very small. I remember being a reformer in 1997 and and kids getting trampled uh, on university campuses or at events. Uh, uh, that Preston Manning was speaking. I I went to an event with him at Much Music in the 97 election, and we had to have the people that were going back and forth uh, escorted in because people were like throwing things and spitting at us as we were walking in Much in much Music. Mila Mulrooney got physically assaulted in 1988. So this whole phenomenon that that, that protests are, are new uh, is wrong. And I think that uh, although people are sympathetic because the, pr the protesters, the ones that have been getting any of the, um, uh, that it's, it, they're very vulgar, like gross, like swearing, you know, yelling at kids, all that. Nobody like supports that. I think it's gross. But I think that the liberals have, uh, if they try to overplay their hand on this, I think that the, it will end up coming back to bite them in the ass. And they sure as fuck better have a better plan than if they think a bunch of protesters uh, every day at an event is going to uh, to change the momentum of this campaign. OK, let me just respond to that and then we'll hear your take. And I agree with you very, very strongly about the overreach issue. And that's why I, I, I phrased my remarks the way I did, because I think it's really dangerous. You know, you used the word earlier in, a, uh, in an earlier pod, David, about weaponizing. And I think trying to weaponize the crowds by the liberals, it's very, very tricky territory. But I do think that there is, and you can say, you can point to historical uh, precedent. Of course, there's historical precedent. Um, you know, you think about um, English, French, and particularly uh, Protestant Catholic arguments that took place in general elections of the you know late 1800s, early 1900s. Of course, there's a, a historical precedent. The precedent that most people will associate this with is the ugliness of the U.S. elections and the Trumpy stuff and all that. That's where a lot of voters' brains will go to. That's the association. Well, they're that being they're, they're being dragged. They're, they're, that that could be because that's the media narrative. Well, when people yell, you know, lock them up, uh, it tends to draw that comparison. My, my my point is this. There yeah, but that was 20,000 people. In, that was 20,000 people in an arena. I, I, I know. I'm just saying that people nevertheless are going to make that association. I think that's the that's the image and the association, the narrative that's going to come to mind. And it's hard on TV, as we know, to see you and Twitter even worse. Like, I can't tell if it's 11 people or 11,000 people, right? So, um, you know, that I think some of those details get lost on people. My, my, my point is this. There is a huge trap for the liberals if they attempt to weaponize this thing and they look like they're being exploitative. There is also a danger for the conservatives, right? They can't appear to be, I won't say tolerant of intolerance, but they can't appear to be indifferent. They can't be appear, appear to be excusing it. Well, too Aaron, smart Aaron to come out immediately. I was just about to say that. He came out and, and condemned it immediately. I think you got to continue to condemn it. Because people will make that association and it will stick and you may not like it and you may think it's unfair, but that will happen. And so I think it's a more than one time thing. I think conservatives have to continue to pound on that and say, those are not my people. That is not my place. That is not my view. 
Um, otherwise, they are going to find that people will dress them in those clothes. I, listen, I still fundamentally disagree, but but we don't have a lot of time on our uh, in the morning. So and it's clear where we're both Scott and I stand. We're in the thick of this election which means 99.999% of you hurly burlyites are getting your fix of news and digital information with more alacrity than ever. I mean, if we're 10 minutes late getting the curse up, my phone starts pinging with your increasingly desperate texts and tweets. Guys, it makes me feel warm all over. Not every Canadian can afford that kind of digital access, though. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, knows it, and they're committed to making the situation better, which is why in 2020... TELUS expanded the reach of their Mobility for Good program and launched TELUS Mobility for Good for seniors. It provides seniors who receive the Guaranteed Income Supplement access to discounted devices and subsidized mobility rate plans so they can stay connected to loved ones, important healthcare tools and information, and just to be entertained by and share the stuff the internet provides. Specifically, TELUS Mobility for Good for Seniors is a discounted, refurbished smartphone, unlimited talk and text, and three gigabytes of data for only $25 a month. It's no small gesture. Across Canada, 2.2 million seniors are eligible for the program. And it's more than the dollars and cents of it. The heart of this is about really connecting. Access to digital technology and what it provides has been proven to help seniors fight feelings of isolation contributing to their mental well-being. Nothing beats being there in person, but suddenly friends and family aren't miles away, they're just a couple of clicks away. I don't have to tell you how important that was during lockdown. You can learn more about it all at telus.com slash connecting Canada. Is it an opportunity for Trudeau to, because I don't really believe that the protests themselves are gonna make all that much of a difference. Um, but is it, is it an opportunity for Trudeau to take even a stronger, to basically paint them as anti-vax people and to take an even stronger position on vaccines that will polarize the election around, around and, and has that given him his entree to take at one more shot but he already, at getting that was pretty the vaccine much, that's, wedge right? But he's already he's already he's already done that. Like you can't try to polarize people against each other for a campaign issue like Trudeau did and then not expect the electorate to be polarized. So he's already he's already done that. He's they've now got to decide if they have the stomach, uh, the stomach to keep it going. But I think it would be a absolutely mass problem if Trudeau decides to spend the next 21 days uh, polarizing people against each other on on the issue, because it's it's not it's not clear cut. Um, it is not clear cut at all. The only the only in terms of let's look at like the leaders in their house, the only people per can, uh, campaign right now uh, that actually has every candidate vaccinated is the NDP. So Trudeau can go and try to polarize, but he's got people in his own party uh, who aren't vaccinated. So it just becomes a very How did they let that happen. Jesus. Ugly because there, because there, there's there, there seems to be zero strategy coming out of this campaign. So if I were them, instead of sitting around and saying there were 20 people out and there's some really crazy people and they have a fuck Trudeau um, uh, sign, let's let's brand our whole campaign around that because, because it's it's really working for us. I think they made a big mistake. They've they have obviously not done anything to calibrate their campaign because it has been an unmitigated disaster for them. It's one of the worst national or centralized campaigns i think i've ever watched uh uh you guys do in the entire time i've been involved in politics so that's where they actually need to get their head in the game look I, Scott, I, i've uh, seen no sign of the i've seen no sign of the pivot that we were talking about last night on the national news i saw that fucking ad that they ran on day one yet again <laughs> so they do not after the three-week mark have a new fucking TV ad, and that ad hasn't moved a vote in their direction since it aired. Uh, um, I, so I don't get, I don't get that. And frankly, their announcement yesterday was on climate, which is fine, but that's not, it's not going to change the trajectory of the campaign either. I guess they had to get that on the mark. But generally, in their announcements, in their daily functions, I've not seen them executing any kind of pivot from what they were doing. Before, the only change has been that they've got these protesters to play off at their events, and so they're getting slightly different coverage. Yeah. But the campaign obviously does not agree with us that it's on the wrong track. The campaign think obviously thinks that it's advertising and its tour and announcement plan that they started the campaign with 
is appropriate and working. And, and I think that's worth a deep dive on one of these podcasts. We won't have the time left for this one today, but I think that that is, I think that's obviously true. Um, you know, they're not changing their plans in terms of where they tour. They're not changing the plans in terms of the kinds of announcements that they put forward. They're not changing their advertising. So I agree with all that. But I do also think, and this is where Jenny and I disagree, I do think um, that I, I've always thought that this election was going to be about COVID. I always thought in a world where Labor Day was going to happen, kids are going to go back to school, the Delta was going to be rising. I always thought that it was inevitable. This thing would circle around and it would end up being about where you stand on the pandemic and on these issues. And I I acknowledge that, that you know, this issue of vaccinated candidates, they've got some vulnerabilities. I still think, um, you know, to my mind, when I watch the Liberal campaign not adjusting and I see these protesters, I feel like the universe is trying to say to Trudeau, for Pete's sake, then we'll try to provide you with a contrast and a fight if you won't go looking for one. And uh, I, I just but think Scott, they've been they've been doing the whole campaign. Their entire campaign plan up until this point has been covid. And all uh, it's done is drive them further down. In the I, I, well, first of all, I don't as think David that. said it's it has been. What has Trudeau talked about other okay. than COVID? Of Let sub me talk. substance. Let me talk about it then. Um, I think he's got too much. hundred billion dollars. I think there's been there's been one announcement after another that had, you know, uh, there have been some COVID, but very little, uh, really. I mean, they've been making policy announcements of, you know, housing and climate change and this and that, and some of them have been better than others. And, uh, long-term care, but they've all been disconnected and non-thematic. That's been the problem with, uh, one of the problems with the campaign. I think this issue has such traction with people. I think it has, it, I think it is one of those things that rises above where people go, well, this is something that actually matters in a real way and a practical way. And by the way, in an urgent way, because I'm going to be confronted with it in the next few days. And I, I just think it's those, one of those classic, uh, one of those classic values fights. And when you say, look, you know, he can continue to try to polarize the country around this, that provides too much agency. We don't agree on that. I don't think having an argument where you say, one party believes that we ought not to have mandatory vaccinations and restrict people's movements in terms of where they go and where they don't go and have passports. And one party does. That's a big fundamental fight in, uh, in the context of still an ongoing pandemic. And I, I think I think that cleavage matters to people. And I think making well, that cleavage matter is a good way to go about this campaign. I'm just, I'm just going to end it by repeating what I, I said is there has been zero evidence of that because uh, Ninety percent of any public messaging that Trudeau has had out during this campaign uh, has been around COVID or a COVID issue, and it's done nothing to help his campaign. I don't. But we've been bitching every day that their messaging has been about these standalone policy announcements that seem to exist in their own pocket universe, disconnected from anything else. So I, I don't. Okay, but Scott, do you think? Let's get, let's cut right to the chase. Do you think people are going to connect these protesters to the Conservative Party of Canada? Yeah, I do. I do think ultimately. I think that there's. I think there's a logic chain where people say, I see people being more upset about this argument and less upset about this argument. And I want, and I think in the main, the majority of voters, certainly enough to get you to uh, a, a parliamentary minority and probably a parliamentary majority, there's enough people out there to say, actually, I want my leaders to not dig this. I want my leaders to disagree with these people. And I think it's incumbent, therefore, on the conservatives to be more forceful in rejecting it. But ultimately, they can't. They can't walk away from the position, and O'Toole can't walk away from the position, that he does not think mandatory vaccination and a passport is a good policy. And I think that's a an anchor they should continue to weigh him down on, because I think this issue isn't going to weigh going away, and I think it's going to intensify in terms of its urgency and importance to people as we get on the other side of Labor Day. Jenny? Well, I still fundamentally disagree. The vast majority of the opposition parties, Trudeau's, Trudeau's an island onto his own, to his, his actual position. He's got he's got the hypocrisy around it, but he's an island to his own and to his his uh, uh, to his position on this. What would you be doing, Jenny, to insulate the conservative campaign against being associated with? The protesters. Well, but they're not associated with the protesters. Aaron spoke about them, but I wouldn't be it's, these aren't our people. We're not doing it. There were a few, you know, people from a campaign that were there. Like there were a lot of people there that weren't being assholes, um, uh, but are no longer part of another uh, local campaign. Um, I would be, you know, if asked, you give the exact same answer that you give. But to put out a statement every day because the prime minister has a fundamental fucking problem with his campaign because it's going off the rails and he's being protested. Uh, I would not get weighed into that every day because then you're screwing up your message. Since Confederation, owning a home has been part of the Canadian dream for most people. That dream is much more than just a monthly mortgage payment. 
A home is where we create our fondest memories and where we can truly be ourselves. For too many, especially young adults, that reality is out of reach and it's getting worse. The good news is our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, or RIA for short, has a plan to save the Canadian dream of home ownership. It includes lowering costs for first-time buyers, ending money laundering in the real estate market, and cutting years of red tape that is standing in the way of more affordable homes for families. The ARIA plan will lay the foundation for a future where all people can find a place to call home. When we support the dreams of all of us who want to own a home, we're building healthier families, stronger communities, and a safer, more secure future for all. Read their plan at aurea.com backslash affordable homes. Um, you know, I really thought, based on the focus group I did on Saturday, that O'Toole is doing a really good job of shaving the sharp edges off the appearance of the party. Um, and that I came away from that group thinking that there were liberal voters in there, that there were New Democratic voters in there, and that there were conservative voters in that group but that nobody thought that the world was going to turn on its axis if the Liberals lost the election and the Conservatives formed the government. That there wasn't the sense of change and therefore loss or consequence um, that uh, would have been there in 2019 and that traditionally fuels um, certainly strategic voting on the left. Um, and... Uh, and and uh, and helps the liberals grab all the moderate voters in the country. I don't know. I I, I think, it, you know, the focus group was on Saturday. These protests heated up. Franks found something in the numbers. Maybe that's all something. But what I heard on Saturday was the conservatives in a pretty sweet position, to be honest. Tentative because people are only learning about O'Toole. Most of the people in my groups didn't know who he was two weeks ago. Let's remember that. Didn't even know who he was. So on the basis of two weeks. What they're seeing is a guy who, you know, sounds like he's in the main and sounds like he's got some ideas and sounds like maybe he's got a plan that doesn't involve spending as much money as Trudeau's plan does. And that well, has some appeal for for people. Sorry, Jenny. Well, listen, and and and, and the last time uh, the conservatives did well, like we it's you're making it sound like he's bringing us out from the wilderness like we we. We were in government for a decade in this country. So if in the last 20 years, in the last 20 years, it's not like the Liberal Party has dominated. They, they've they dominated right. uh, they, they've dominated the last six years. They've sucked the oxygen out of the room uh, with Trudeau's celebrity status, which is we're seeing now um, uh, we're seeing now is 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 waning. But you, to, you guys keep making it seem like, thank God, O'Toole is here to sharpen the edges. We govern for a fucking decade. We won three I'm elections comparing it. I'm comparing. I'm comparing it against Sheer, who I thought presented an unelectable option, and was still doing better nationally in the polls than than what Aaron is right now. Uh, no, I, I, no, not if O'Toole. Not if O'Toole is a thirty-seven. Well, that's if that's if that we think and, that that's and, the case. And, and and the big difference is, to my mind, the big difference is that Sheer was never competitive on Ontario for one day. Of 2019, which is why we always, the three of us, despite the fact that the polls got close, we knew the Conservatives were never in a position to win in 2019 because Ontario was never close. But in this election, Ontario was close. Well, I guess we'll see. There's po po polls all over the place. It's why, <laughs> but but those those impressions that you're detecting in the groups, David, are why if I were the Conservatives, I would be very anxious about having people hear me separate myself from these protesters and position myself in the mainstream of opinion when it comes to mandatory vaccinations to the degree to which I can. Because if those opinions are fragile, if he's got something that good going where people are like, I am not scared about electing this guy and I'm very open to buying what he's selling, then on the issue that most people care most about, you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of it. And if you allow this issue to take off and become the dominant litmus test of the campaign, then that's a problem for it because those that, that fragile positioning can evaporate. And I think that's that's a trick for the conservatives, just as the trick for the liberals is not to look like you're whoring this issue and not to be too exploitative and obvious and transparent as you play your cards. All right. It's time for our curse. Can you believe how time has flown by? 
in this uh, in this episode. Thank God we get to come back tomorrow and talk about it some more. Um, who wants to start with their curse of the day? Go ahead, Scott. My curse of the day is uh, to the liberal war room. And my curse of the day to the liberal war room is this, and it came up indirectly earlier. It would appear as though not all liberal candidates have been vaccinated. The prime minister said on the weekend when he was pressed on this that they will be by the time of the filing deadline. That's going to be later today. Nominations close tomorrow. So if there are people who haven't got their second shots, whatever, or if you have to bounce people, uh, whatever. But to the war room, I say this. When that filing deadline happens, make certain two things. One, that all your candidates are vaccinated and there is no counterpunch on that. And that at that point, when it's for real that these people are on your ballot, that you can say that that's 100% buttered to the edge. And the second thing is, identify the conservative candidates who are not and pound that issue right up their ass because they can't distance themselves from those candidates once that filing deadline is is closed and there's only two choices at that point you either wear those people or you lose the conservative spot on the ballot by dumping them if there's enough of a protest and anger uh and you in the land about it so i say to the liberal war room clean off your own doorstep and then go dump in a bunch of topsoil on the conservatives yeah, well, I, I guess I can't give my curse of the day to read for just so fundamentally being, uh, I believe, out of touch with where the electorate uh, is. Uh, my uh, curse goes to the uh, my curse goes to the uh, uh, conservative war room for a few things. Uh, one, things are going well. This is actually like I find the worst mood in the, in in, it, in a campaign. This is the position with three weeks out that I wish I wasn't in. Um, uh, it actually becomes a much harder in a fundamentally different way uh, in terms of managing a candidate managing candidates, managing campaigns. Um, uh, so I th they have to be very careful. They've been, they've been doing well and they have to continue, but they also have to be careful uh, uh, as well uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of core supporters. If, if I was PPC and, and Maverick coming out of Aaron's interview yesterday, they did the live interviews uh, almost not debate style, but live back-to-back -back interviews with all the party leaders. Uh, there was stuff coming out of that in terms of uh, in terms of energy policy. Uh, that if I was uh, if I was running against uh, someone in in Alberta or Saskatchewan or even parts of BC, um, I'd be uh, I'd be jumping on. I think that uh, I think candidates would much rather be answering uh, where their vaccine status is as to whether they personally support a carbon tax and whether uh, Alberta thinks that uh, two pipelines. Um, I, uh, are uh, are enough for the federal government to approve. Interesting. My curse is a very narrow appeal. It goes right to Tom Pitfield. Tom is a friend of mine, and I respect Tom. Tom. Data scientists are the best people at what they do. But I'm just begging you to get that TV ad off the air, Tom. It is not <laughs> working. It is not working, and we need a TV ad that frames this election. We need a TV ad that tells people what the election's about, that ad doesn't do it. So please, it's been two weeks. I wish it had never aired, but please take it off now and put something with a little bit more edge and a little bit more, uh, a little bit more sharpness on there. So thank you, everybody, for listening today. Coming back to the curse. I know we left you over the weekend, but we're back, and we're back right until Friday. And I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association. I want to thank Frank Graves and Ecos for their... Uh, detailed data and uh, up to the minute tracking and I want to thank of course Nick Taylor Basie and Political for joining us and being part of this exercise. Scott, Jenny, love you. See you tomorrow.